Welcome to FPB's Meet the Candidates. This Cable 10 series allows you, the voter, to get a better view from our candidates, their views on issues that are important to our community. This is all leading up to the primary election, which actually has started now and goes until June 23rd. That's right, things are a little different this year as we are social distancing, so we are conducting our interviews from different locations. Uh, this year we've taken questions from social media and email, so we have a lot of different topics to cover, so we should jump right in. So today's guest is Tracy Hopper, and she is a candidate for Jailer. Welcome, Tracy. Hello, Kathy. Thank you so much for hosting our Meet the Candidate this year. Well, I'm excited about this, so uh, I want to start, just give you the opportunity to tell us about yourself and why you have decided to run for jailer. Thank you. I'm Tracy Hopper. I am a candidate for Franklin County Jailer. This is not the first time I've been a candidate for this office. My first time running was um, less than a year ago, and, and um, I am as dedicated this time as I was the last time to um, go and sign my name and be ready to serve Franklin County. I am married. I've lived in Franklin County um, all of my life, um, my adult life, and I have two children, two grandchildren. I currently work at uh, Franklin County Public Schools, and I have for the past um, 20 years have had always had some involvement in Franklin County in the public and serving the public in some manner. I have experience through pretrial services that has kept me in the jail for years, um, for the past five years. What led me to the uh, clerk's office to sign my name was wanting, wanting to make a change. We, we have some issues that need to be changed. I have a dedication to this county, to this community, and I want to serve Franklin County. Thank you. Uh, so you've talked about your past a little bit. Why don't you tell us about what previous experience you have that you feel has prepared you for the role of jailer? When, when I left high school, I went to work at the Franklin County Jail when we were at still in the old jail in Catfish Alley. Um, they were looking for an administrative assistant. I filled that position and worked at the jail until I became 21 years old over in the admin side. When I became 21 years old, I transferred over to the secured side of the jail. By the time I was 23 years old, I had already reached, I had been promoted to shift supervisor, a corporal, a sergeant, and then a staff sergeant. By the time I was 24 years old, I was in charge of a $6.5 million facility. Throughout the time, even after I left it years into, uh, <clears throat> after I left the jail, I stayed in, in, in with um, pretrial services, the administrative office of the courts. I have really never left um, and, and not been a part of the jail in some, in some way. The jail is, you know, when people think about the jail, I think they only think about people being arrested and brought to jail. That's just a very, very small slice of this. I've worked through um, the administrative office of the courts, like I said, through pretrial services, which would take me into the jail daily. I also worked for the administrative office of the courts and did records research and statistics. So I've always had some connection um, with the jail. And just recently when I decided to go, when I decided to go down and sign up, I had to resign my position in pretrial. I went back to Bondert Middle School and I'm a paraeducator there. I work in the special education department and love my job there. I love being out in the community um, and serving Franklin County. Well, for those of us who, who may not be in the know, share with us what responsibilities uh, come with being the jailer. What does that mean? The, probably your biggest responsibility is a four and a half million dollar budget. And <clears throat> that's probably the biggest um, responsibility. You have um, 50 staff that you're responsible for. 
the jailer has the responsibility of anywhere from 150 to 300 inmates and being any level from low to more of a high risk type of inmate. And we have inmates that go out in the community and work. We have inmates that work inside the facility. There, the responsibility to the community, we have community volunteers that come in that need to be taken care of. The jail also provides transportation to the courts. We have to provide the proper court paperwork to the clerk, also to the judge's office. You know, we're in constant contact with the judge's office. We're in contact with probation and parole. We are in contact with um, drug court. There are so many entities that all have to work together in order for this to be a good working um, facility. You know, not only, you know, do we have to care, you know, for the inmates and the staff, you know, we have to worry. We have uh, law enforcement coming in. We have to, you know, really have a good relationship with law enforcement. We have to have a good relationship with our local bar association. You know, when our attorneys come in, you know, their time is precious too. Um, and we have to take care of the attorneys. They have to get their job done. And so we can get these people out of the, the facility. Okay. So what do you see as the biggest issue facing the Franklin County Regional Jail right now? And how would you address it if you're elected? Um, I think that changing the culture of the jail out there right now, um, we are um, maybe lacking a little bit in training over the past you know, four or five years. That's something that needs to be addressed. And we need to look at training our officers so we can keep our officers. Money is not the only thing that will keep your officers there. You, you have to have really sound training and that doesn't just stop right after their first two weeks of training when they start at the jail. Um, you know, you have to keep up with that. You have to do your recertifications and you have to work with them. And if you have training officers out there, they have to stay, they have to keep up with them. So training would be one of the biggest things because along with that, if you're changing the culture of the jail by training your officers, then you're building your programs, you're looking for accreditation from professional organizations outside of the jail, you're looking for um, positive law reviews. We need to have these things in order to change the culture of the jail, which, you know, then leads us to, you know, working on the budget. We've missed a big opportunity of um, working on the budget over the last four years. We've, you know, across the state, everyone was, all the jail, county jails were, you know, cram packed at 120, 150 percent, you know, inmates sleeping on the floor. So during the time when we were making that kind of money, um, per diem on state and federal inmates, we needed to be shifting that money into um, programs, inmate programs. And I'm talking about rehabilitation programs. If you're just warehousing inmates, felons, for one or two years and then you put them back out on the street, you're absolutely guaranteeing that they're gonna come back. And they may come back even worse because they've spent all that time sleeping on a concrete floor and with, with nothing else to do, but you know, having idle time on their hands. So we missed some opportunities to build these programs. This is something that I won't miss. Inmate programs can be built out of the commissary account. Um, I'm sure everybody's been, um, you know, I'm, I'm hoping everyone has been following, you know, the issues that, um, E-cigarette sales was a big thing at the jail. It was a it was a money maker, and we missed before the ordinance was signed. And we were making, you know, from my understanding and open records, hundreds of thousands of dollars a year. But we weren't taking that money that is only supposed to be spent directly on inmates. We weren't taking that money and putting it toward the programs. You know, there's a solid foundation out there right now that they have going on, and they missed 
three years of opportunities to fund that program that they have out there. I will not miss those opportunities. You know, these things have to be done. If you fund these programs, then you can go to the Department of Corrections where now we get $31 per diem per day for a state inmate. If we are accredited, if we change the culture of our jail and, you know, fix some of the things that are not right out there, and, and we have to put some money into the jail. It's over 30 years old. It's, it's crumbling, and we haven't been. You know, all that time we were making money when inmates were slammed to the walls out there, you know, busting at the seams, we weren't putting money back into the jail. So now there's a contract and somebody's wanting to come out there at the tune of hundreds of thousands of dollars and fix the things that are wrong. It should have never gotten in that shape. When we were making money, we weren't responsible when what, for what we were doing with that money. So the culture would be the first and biggest thing that we change. We've got to build these programs. There's ways to look at um, um, things to sell on commissary. I understand now that um, through a fiscal court meeting that they're trying pouches, nicotine pouches. That's a concern to me. That opens up. I think that those need to be medically approved. Nicotine in high doses can cause a heart attack. I just don't think that that's a good idea. It's not something that I would look at. I wouldn't look at playing cards or board games. I worked at the jail for years, seen some of the worst fights ever over gambling. You can't, you, you just can't do that. That's not an option. And you can't mark up a deck of cards or candy land high enough to, uh, you know, make any revenues up that we're missing out there. <clears throat> so the culture, the training, and then the revenues will come once you change those things and you build these programs. And, and I'm not saying to build these programs because we need the money. We have to build these programs because they are the right thing to do. And we've been missing that for a long time, not doing the right thing. So <clears throat> we, we're, we're faced with a lot of lawsuits and a lot of people don't know that. I've done my homework on this before I came back and signed up this time. I never questioned whether I was going to do it or not. I just needed to do my homework. I've always been committed to Franklin County. So I, I've never once said, I don't know if I'm going to run or not. I know that I'm going to run and I know I'm going to run the next time. And then I'm going to run the next time. I'm, this is not just something that um, is short term for me, but we've, I've, I've looked into the lawsuit and, and, you know, and they're pending. We don't know. We don't know what they, you know, what's going to happen. Okay. We, Tracy, I'm going to stop you there for just a second because you're hitting on some questions I'm going to get to. So oh, I'm sorry. That's okay. <laughs> um, but very uh, yeah, I see that. Um, but let, let me hit on something that it's kind of immediate right now. We've seen massive outbreaks um, of the coronavirus and other correctional facilities. What is your plan to address a possible COVID outbreak uh, at the jail if that happens, if you're elected? I'm not sure um, what the appointed temporary jailer, he said that he has empty pods out there. There is a section of that jail when it was built that is segregated from the rest of the jail because when it, we opened up out there in 87, it was a juvenile detention. So it's definitely away from, was away from the inmate population. That would be the perfect place. And because it's right there by the Sally Port, when officers bring them in, they won't be coming into the general population. We, we need to have our medical staff out there already should have had a plan and it should be posted and everybody should know it. And they should talk about it every day in their briefing, what they're going to do. Are they testing? You know, testing is, is really important and, and our governor's talking about that. Let's test people, let's see what's going on. You know, I don't look that this is gonna be over in January. So if I am successful and I go through January and we haven't tested the inmates, they, they deserve that. We, you know, they need to be tested. So housing them over in the old juvenile area away from that, you know, we have to watch officers when they come in. You know, I've heard some of the jails are, they have officers that are actually staying there in the dorms and they have a separate training area and they've been staying there. 
we just have to be careful. Use the same precautions that you would use at home. You know, you don't want to bring it in because if if that gets inside a confined space like that, um, it has no choice but to spread. And we've seen that, whether it be in a nursing home or at Green River, you know, they're having a horrible time there. And now at Alice, the federal, the federal building in Lexington, it's bad. So let's get ahead of it. Do the testing. See what see what's going on out there and see if the inmates are testing positive. You know, <clears throat> if, if we're quarantined, we're quarantined for 14 days. So if they come in and they have to go over to that area, then they'll stay there for 14 days. I understand, um, you know, there was an incident where um, there was uh, a police chase, something happened, and, you know, one of the suspects had a t had a fever and they wouldn't take them you know so now law enforcement is wondering well we're going to have to take them out to the hospital and then we're going to have to try to get a hold of the judge and we're going to have to say the jail has refused to take this inmate you know and that's something that we have to uh, be very cautious of is you know turning away inmates. I understand we don't want to spread of that, but you have to understand we have a constitutional liability that we have to take these inmates. Okay. Well, um, earlier you mentioned lawsuits. So if elected, what steps would you take to reduce the risk of litigation uh, by the inmates? Training. Training, training, training. Um, pending lawsuits that we have now, you know, just from, you know, I can't speak on these lawsuits, what I've seen from um, the news, what I've seen, what I've read, you know, I, I have a copy of all of them. I filed it. I went to the federal building. I got a copy of everything. I've read all of um, the lawsuits. I've, you know, filed an open records with CACO and look, I'm looking at, you know, what we have open there. And it's really important that we train officers to understand to understand there's nothing more important than your observation and doing your rounds and doing your due diligence. And sometimes when there's, <clears throat> when there's a, a big population and you're having officers, you know, that are calling in and not coming in, you know, you, you need to be ready if you're of administrative staff or the jailer that you can work that you can go over there and you can cover some empty spot. That's been a big part of the problem at the jail and these lawsuits, there's no leadership there. There's nobody there holding down the fort. If you're just showing up a couple days a week for, you know, four or five hours, you, you are not a positive leader. And every Friday, you know, hey, I'm not gonna be there every Friday. I'm gonna do whatever, um, and I'm not gonna be there. That's not good leadership. The jail needs someone that's gonna be there every day. The jail needs somebody that knows the ins and outs of <clears throat> court, uh, judicial relationships, um, law enforcement relationships. These are the things that will prevent any further um, legal action against the jail. We have to look at responsibility of the booking area. You know, every morning when I would go in as a pretrial officer, <clears throat> there would be chaos. I'm just going to say it, chaos. You have to have somebody that's administratively prepared to have all of the paperwork, any Thing that came in for the night before so you know the judges can be ready to conduct court if you're not prepared to do that if inmates have if people have not been booked into the jail then you're violating people's constitutional right you can't just say hey we're not going to book them in and we'll we'll get them arranged later that can't happen people that cannot happen. Pretrial services has recently went back to no longer 24 hours. You know, um, Chief Minton signed a bill. Every 12 hours now, somebody has to be out there and they have to be interviewed and they have to be presented to a judge. There's, you know, a different type of um, release now. And I know a lot of people don't like that, but if the jail is not knowledgeable about everybody else's responsibility, the court, law enforcement, attorneys, then we have a we have a big issue, we have a big issue. But the lawsuits, um, if if everybody is doing their job and being respected in their job, 
that will cut down. And, and you have to understand there are safeguards, you know, if, if the observations are not being done, um, you know, there's cameras out there and that will say whether the officers are doing their due diligence. You know, this is important. If someone comes in that is intoxicated, you know, you better be checking on them. If someone comes in and they're screaming that um, they need help, they probably need help because you may open the door at eight o'clock the next morning and find that there, somebody gave birth. Well, you mentioned that, and that one of the questions I was going to ask is, how would you ensure that the medical program is adequate to handle the needs of the jail? That would be something that I would have to sit down with Southern Health, Southern Health Partners, and we would have to talk about my expectations, the Department of Corrections expectations. We um, can't do, you know, we've signed a new contract for them to be 24-7, and I've really not gotten any definition from open records request about what that really means. What does 24-7 mean? Does that mean you're available to answer a phone call? Does that mean that there will be a nurse in that building 24-7? You know, um, <clears throat> so when, when uh, we have someone new coming in the back door, are they taking the temperature? You know, are they monitoring this person that um, may have had too much to drink, maybe, you know, in an overdose status? You know, these are the things that um, I, I will have a, uh, I, I will have to discuss with Southern Health. Okay, Department. well, I'll move on to my next question. And what is your plan to ensure equal treatment of male inmates and female inmates? <clears throat> That's something that's been um, in the popula the female population across the state of Kentucky, across the U.S. is rising. It's not going down, it's rising. So <clears throat> as it stands now, the male inmates run the kitchen, they run the laundry room. Um, there has to be something else that, that can be done and in my vision I know that it can be done you know even if the females are you know taking over the laundry room and they do the laundry responsibility and it may just be on a different shift let's not pretend we're not staffed 24 hours a day out there we just have to be cautious you know um, it's never ever a good idea and it's in every policy and procedure a male officer should never ever be alone with a female inmate. Never, ever, ever, ever. So, but, but there are, should be two female um, officers on every shift. And, and, and that's the way, it, when I was there, you know, when we were doing that, we had two female correctional officers. Um, so when they're working, they're being supervised. It's no different. We can't say, oh, we're, they'll put notes in the laundry. Well, do you think the male inmates wouldn't put a note in a laundry to the girls? Um, you know, these are things that if you're supervising what they're doing, then these things will be cut, you know, this will be cut down. Okay. And it takes a, a, a real officer to do it. Okay. We're, we're running a little short on time, so I'm, I'm going to try to get a couple questions in that can, that can be shorter answers. Okay. As a jailer, if, if you can, as jailer, you will likely have to deal with the effects of the drug drug ep epidemic that uh, has hit Franklin County, and not only Franklin County, but nationwide. Um, how will you ensure that addicted inmates get the critical treatment that they need? And how will you ensure that inmates do not have access to drugs within the facility? Again, training is, is, is the key to a lot of this training. So there are you can come in the back door with the drugs. <clears throat> the guys that are out working in the public can come in with the drugs. And unfortunately, officers will, you know, can bring in the drugs. And, you know, so stopping it at the back door is a part of doing this on your own or doing this with a highly trained officers that you do the same thing each, each time. You know, if you're trained to working, booking, this is what you're looking for. I understand that they have a body scanner that they've bought. Since they've had that body scanner, there has still been a large amount of drugs come in that facility. That has not prevented it from coming in. 
we have to be diligent in what we're doing. You have to be able to look at their current charges, see what kind of condition they're in, and you know you just have to watch. You have to be trained. You can't leave the booking area and let someone sit out there in passive booking. If you think there's a opportunity, there's you know a chance that they brought something in, you would put someone in a dry cell, and that would you know prevent them from being able to flush it or get rid of it. You know there are there are there are ways that I believe that a, an, an officer, an actual human being, would be able to cut down on that if they are trained and they know what they're looking for. Um, okay. You know, the body scanner is great. It's just a little extra, but you know, it's, it's, it's not been a hundred percent. Okay. How would you improve uh, communication and reporting efforts? Uh, it, we'd have to report to the fiscal court, but also communication efforts with the public on what's going on at the jail. You know, especially there might be good work going on at the jail that you want to share. Right. So transparency is part of my platform. The, one of the biggest things that um, people think is jail is about people being brought in the back door. Oh, someone got arrested and that's it. So <clears throat> I want to educate the public about what's going on at the jail. Good or bad, we have to own it. And I, I believe that, you know, if we put a picture on Facebook and says, you know, hey, look at this, we did this, it, it, putting a picture out there and actually living it and doing it is two different things. Just because it's on Facebook or on social media doesn't mean that it's real. We have to show, we have to prove, and that's where I'm saying, you know, that we get those um, accreditation from you know these community organizations that are saying hey let's look and see what the jail is doing you know their 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 program out there that you know like I said we have a good platform out there now and I'm excited to get out there and build that program but we have to show them you know during the fiscal court meeting the uh, appointed temporary jailer now just said um, well, we might have one inmate that we can um, bill a higher per diem. That should not have been the case. This program has been building and building, and the lack of funding is um, is sad. Is really sad. But we have to we have to show people, and not on Facebook. We have to show the community what we're doing. And as far as reporting to fiscal court, um, you know, our money at the end of the year will show that. If I'm not standing there, you know, with my hat in my hand saying I need more money, that's going to show. That's going to tell fiscal court that I'm doing what I'm supposed to be doing out there. I want to. You know, the jail is not a money-making place. Don't ever get in the business of running a jail to think that you're going to, you know, make money. Make the money, sustain yourself, keep your lights on out there, and start building and working on your program. And then the money will come. Do the right thing, and then the money, the, you know, the, the revenues will come in, at the jail. But if you're not doing the right thing, the revenues won't follow. And we've seen that for the last five years. Okay. Well, we are out of time, so I'm going to take uh, the opportunity to turn it over to you, let you look at the camera, and tell our viewers who are voters why they should vote for you, why you're the best candidate for the job for jailer. Thank you, Kathy. Um, Franklin County, I am dedicated to serving you. I have made no promises to anybody except for you to um, look at your five and a half million dollar budget and tell you that I will always look for ways to cut your tax dollars. I will always look for ways to do what's in the best interest of the county, what's in the best interest of everyone. I am knowledgeable about all of the working parts of the jail and not just someone got arrested and brought in the back door. That is just a very, very small part. I am excited about getting out there and getting to work for Franklin County, even though it is a short term, you know, that I'll, I'll only feel for two years. I'll be back after two years and I will run for this office. And I'm not doing this in a short term. I want to make a long term commitment to Franklin County to make improvements and educate the citizens of Franklin County about what goes on at the jail. Okay. On June, on June 
whatever day you vote, um, cast, please cast a vote for me, whether it be on paper. I am the right choice. I am the real choice for Franklin County. I have never faltered in how I want to serve this community. Never once have I been in question. Never once have I said, I do not want to. I have a commitment and a desire to make things right. Please cast your vote for me. I, I understand that um, you may support someone else in, with a, their sign in your yard. Remember, signs don't vote. When you go in to make cast your vote, please vote for your who's going to take the best care of your four and a half million dollar taxpayers dollars. Thank you. Okay, thank you so much, Tracy. I appreciate you taking the time to sit down with me today, and I, I know that our viewers appreciate hearing from you. So, to our viewers, I want to remind you that voting is different this year. So, be sure to go online to govoteky.com to request your ballot and uh, your ballot will be mailed to you. Uh, and, but also check out information on this year's local voting procedures because they're, they're different this year. Um, so it's election season, you guys. So let's get informed. That's what we're here for. And once you're informed, go voice your choice. Uh, that's it for this segment of Meet the Candidates. We'll see you next time. <music>